is really about that I am coming to terms with who I am. During the pandemic, I have to look at myself a lot on a computer screen, like everybody here. And I realized that I am this very loud, sometimes rude and small person who has a face that has naivety and inexperience written all over it. So this means that despite having a BSc, MSc, and PhD in computer science, and having worked in technology for almost 20 years, in my second language, I experience mansplaining all the time. And that probably explains why I am this loud and slightly rude person, because sometimes this is the only way for me to be heard and my opinion to be recognized at all. But I don't blame any individuals for that, because through my own research, I understand that our actions in social interaction are to a great extent subconscious. This is because in a face-to-face -face encounter, we constantly exchange and evaluate social signals we send to each other through both verbal and nonverbal channels. So we have to think about the words we say, the tone of voice we use, our facial expressions, our posture, gesture, mannerism. For instance, if we go to see a talk, we'll be looking at a speaker and we'll nod slowly to encourage her to carry on. Or if, you, if we feel, feel skeptical, we'll fold our arms in front of us and tilt our head slightly. So now I'm getting you all self-aware, let's talk about a conscious brain. Our conscious brain, or our main CPU, has a rather limited bandwidth. It can't deal with processing and triggering all sorts of signals at the same time. So a lot of this very complex process actually happens subconsciously and automatically, as summarized by Bark and Chatrand as the unbearable automaticity of being. Well, it is no surprise that we're not always in charge of our actions as we would like to be. So I don't blame anyone who has the sudden urge to explain, to mansplain to me when they see me. Instead, I blame the media, who has a long history of placing younger-looking female at the lower end of the tech-savvy scale. So if my face reminds someone of this naive person they saw on TV, they're not always in a position to fight with their instinct to resume otherwise. The good news is that mainstream media is recognizing this problem. So you already have dating shows or singing competitions where the judges have to judge purely on the singing voice before they can turn around and see the singer. And for me, partially thanks to the lockdown, I found my solution. So, as someone who has been working in virtual reality technology for almost 20 years, I have a bunch of toys at home purely for work purposes. <laughs> so, so, during the lockdown, even at the peak of it, I had the privilege to partying with my friends, colleagues, and meeting strangers I've never met in real life. And last Christmas, we even organized a karaoke party in VR chat, and one of my colleagues decided to show up in the body of a chili pepper, another one, a mushroom. So interactions in these platforms are definitely quite peculiar. But what's really peculiar for me is that I realized I didn't have to be so loud to get attention, neither have I experienced any mansplaining, which has been quite refreshing. I think this is because on these platforms, the body we live in is more a matter of choice rather than biology. Somehow, it, uh, it, really ex it really eliminates our urge to judge the book by its cover. Um, so this could be an opportunity for us to redefine social interaction because on these platforms, we really have a more equal way of evaluating each other by the content rather than the packaging we're stuck with. So you might, see, you might say, why do we need VR for that? We can easily talk to someone on an online platform without revealing our physical identity. But if you ever tried one of those devices, you will know that in VR, it feels very different. As summarized by Professor Mouse later back in 2009, when you put a VR headset on, three things happen. 
First, you have 3D stereo vision. You have two separate images, one for each eye. That's how you see things in 3D, just like when you go to a 3D cinema. And in a 3D cinema, you see a train coming at you, you get really scared, and instinctively, you turn around and you see your friend sitting next to you, and you realize the train you saw was not real. But in VR, there is no escape. In VR, our body is trapped inside the virtual reality. Just like how outside of VR, our body is trapped in reality. And last but not least, VR supports sensory motor contingency. I'll explain. When I'm giving this talk, I like to walk around on the stage because I like to see all of you. I don't have to plan my actions. My body moves automatically to fulfill my intention. And in VR, the same rule applies. Thanks to head tracking technology, we're able to update the graphic display simultaneously as we move. So in VR, when our vision and motor systems work together exactly the same way as they do in real life, we have this strong feeling of being somewhere else. And in social interaction, we will have the strong feeling of being with somebody else. So social VR is still at its very early days, but it already supports a lot of very useful and subtle social signals which are currently missing on the 2D platform. For instance, standard HMDs would normally come with the capacity of hand tracking. So in VR, you would have three control points, your head and both of your hands, and we can use them to drive the body language of our avatars, just like we do in real life. And we use something called inverse kinematics to do that. So in VR, I could lean forward towards someone to encourage them to talk, or in a group conversation, I can use head orientation to indicate turn taking. So these are the kind of spatial body language we use all the time in real life, and we don't have to think about it. And in VR, these social signals are also, are also automatically preserved. You can obviously do the same thing on a 2D media, but you will have to make a lot more conscious effort in that. And that's why sometimes after an online meeting, you feel more exhausted than the real life one. And a future consumer uh, headset market will also see more and more often integrated built-in eye and lip tracking. So they will track our facial movements and drive the animation of our avatars at the same time as well. So it's just a matter of time before everyone can express ourselves with our facial expressions on social VR. But VR is not just a place for us to hide away from real life social interactions. It is actually revolutionizing the way we interact in real life. And these are some of my own works. Since 2004, I have been working with psychologists on using VR to develop psychotherapy for social anxiety. I have been working with neuroscientists in using VR to understand certain neurological disorders, such as autism. And with medical doctors, we're developing communication tools to try to help medical doctors to better communicate with their patients. And I hope I can share some of these findings with you another time. And today is more about me coming to terms with who I am. Because I thought a lot of my frustrations from real life comes from my appearance. I thought being this small, youngish, female-looking person um, really stopped me from achieving things I could otherwise achieve. But during the pandemic, when I had opportunities to customize my avatars for VR, I realized I always chose something that closely resembles my own feature. And this makes me think, actually, I'm quite comfortable with who I am. And it's probably because of some of the frustrations I'm experiencing in, re in real life that has really pushed me into doing uh, research in this amazing area of virtual reality quite early on, so, which has been really re rewarding. So I'm just really thinking I'm coming to terms and getting really comfortable with you know, who I am and where I end up with. But that's not the case for everyone. And actually, 
Even before the pandemic, there is a growing population across the globe where people are spending increasingly amount of time on social media, uh, social VR platforms. And some of them even spend more time on VR than they spend in real life interacting with other people. And a lot of them would choose to adapt a body that's very different from themselves, either a, da a cat, a dog, or chili pepper, mushroom, or another a body of another human, but with a different gender, ethnicity, or age. This makes me think, maybe next time I go into social VR, I could try to put myself in a tall man's body so I can experience mansplaining from the other side. And this triggers some really interesting questions. The first one is, how far are we from the future where we only see the digital others? It's quite a scary scenario, but I think because of the pandemic and the pressure from you know, having to travel less because of climate change, we should all consider that. And the second one is more of a philosophical question. Which one is more real? Our physical appearances or how we want to be perceived? I am not a philosopher. I don't have answers to this question. But I do know for sure that VR will be an important part in our journey to find these answers. So here is my final slide, which I'd like to share this image with you. It's reproduced from the book, Physical Computing, How Computers See Us Now. So for computers, we're just a eye, a pair of ears, and a finger to click the like button or to confirm a purchase. But that's not who we are. We see, we hear, and we use our body to interact, to feel, to embrace the world and each other. It is shocking to see how computers are limiting us and reshaping our senses as human beings. But this doesn't have to be the future. Keyboards and mouse were only invented in the early days of computing, and they don't have to be there to define our future. Instead, we could use VR as our future interface with technology, as it removes some of the barriers imposed by our keyboard, our mouse, and our flat screen. So I want to finish my talk, really, with my vision of the future of virtual reality. Virtual reality will not replace reality. Rather, it's a place for us to take a break from reality, because sometimes it does get a bit overwhelming, it's a place where we can do away with limits imposed by our biology, a place we can be who we want to be. So that when we put a headset down, step back into reality, we can be a better version of ourselves and make the world around us a better place. Thank you.